If you want the best texture bake for your 3D model, be sure to follow these five tips plus a bonus one at the end. I just got through the modeling, UV mapping, and texture baking process for this AGL long coat that I'm preparing as a game ready asset. I've captured the entire process and everything is top of mind, so I wanted to make sure to create this video to cover the texture baking. In my Discord channel, we get a lot of questions on how to get the best bake possible. So I wanted to make sure to get this video devoted to that. So let's jump right into it. So tip number one is the silhouette of your model. So we can see here we have this AGL long cult that I've been working on. If I take, for example, and enable wireframe on shaded, you can see that areas that need the most geometry have it. The cylinder, the back of the cylinder, the grip, and you contrast that with the barrel, which is very cube-like and doesn't need as much geometry. So in order to get the best bakes, we need to make sure to maintain as much geometry in the areas that will need it. So if I enable my high poly, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. I will just hide the full long cold and just look at the cylinder for this example. We can see we have the high poly here. I'm using a remesh workflow here. And the key thing is I wanna make sure my low poly matches the silhouette of the high poly. So one really good way to do that is selecting your model and going and isolate with board slash on the numpad and go into flat mode. This will allow you to view the model completely shadeless. So that way you're only looking at the silhouette of the model. I'm constantly checking the overall silhouette and the flat shaded mode to make sure it looks as good as possible. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the context that the model will be being used for. So for example, I'm creating this as a high quality game ready asset for games like Call of Duty, Battlefield and whatnot. And in these examples, you can see that the overall silhouette of the cylinders are really high detailed, right? That's where probably a lot, if not the majority of the poly count is being used. You can see these in other shots from the game engine and it just holds up incredibly, incredibly well. There are some other examples where you start to notice the faceting in some areas for lower end games. So this gives you a good idea of how detailed these parts should be, not only from a real time standpoint, but from a baking standpoint. Now from specifically a baking standpoint, if I look in here and unisolate my model and grab the low poly, and for this example, I will just throw a decimation on the model and decimate this by half to start, right? So we went and decimated this by half and everything is still looking pretty good, right? It still holds up, but where things start to fall apart is the actual holes where the round is going to be. If I push this even, even further, you can really start to see that the overall silhouette is being impacted by the decimation, especially on the inside and outside. So if you want clean bakes, making sure that you have a good silhouette to support your low poly for the high poly baking will be crucial. I also have another example here and I'll jump to this scene file here. Here you can see if I enable wireframe that I have some cylinders here that have about 16 sides, some that have eight, some that have six, and some that have four. You may think, well, why are you using four sides for something that should be cylindrical? I showed this as a bad example because I see this a lot. A lot of times as I'm teaching classes, students just try to make sure they get a four-sided cylinder and it just doesn't work, right? So at minimum, at absolute minimum, if you have something cylindrical and it's not that close, go with six. I would urge you to at least go with eight but if you really have to get it low poly, six would be the bare bones minimum. And then here you can see 16. Now, how does this look like when we bake our models? Here's an example of how things look as we start to texture from high to low poly. Again, 16 here on the left. Here we got about eight and things are looking okay, but you can start to see you get these noticeable faceting here. And then as we continue to push that down from six and even worse to four, okay? so. To wrap up, making sure that your cylinder and your silhouettes and spherical objects really have the geometry that they need to get the best bake possible. 
Now for the next tip, it's going to be hard edges and UV seams. What do I mean by that? So if we jump back into Blender and we look at our model, so I wanna show you artifacts that happen as your texture bake. Here we have an example of a cylinder and in this cylinder, if I zoom in specifically around this area here, you can see that we start to get these white and black lines on our bakes. And if I go to the baking menu using Substance, You'll see that under UV seams, using one of the newer versions of Substance, it will tell you missing seams on hard edges. And Substance knows that that is going to cause artifacts when your texture bake. Looking at this inside of Blender, let's hide our high polys and bring back a couple examples of these cylinders. So there's a couple of different ways you can go about it. One is if you just take your mesh right click and do a full blown shade smooth, right? Where it softens all of the normals here. The other example is using hard edge smoothing. So here you can see if I'm using shade with auto smooth instead of, so here's shade smooth, right click and do shade auto smooth. You can see that it starts to hold up a lot better and the smoothing looks good. In this specific example, I did not add UV seams where I have hard edges. And that is what is causing this artifacting here inside of Substance Painter. You start to have these cracks and a lot of times you'll see this and think that they're supposed to be there, they're not. And there's an easy way to avoid them. By going back here, if I look at this example, you can see that everywhere I have a hard edge, I have a UV seam. And even in this case, so if I actually hide my seams, and enable sharp, you'll see that I have some other areas that weren't picked up by, you know, selecting by sharp edges. So these are mainly set as sharp here using the auto smooth. Another thing that helps you understand is looking at what's called split normals. Because what happens is for your split vertices, when you use hard edges, it is essentially separating the faces and the edges from each other. So it's splitting the edges and splitting the normals here. So you'll see some examples of that going through these different normal view modes. Now, if you look at the soften edged here, right? What, what is happening here is that it's going to be averaging these normals. I highly recommend you take a look at, is a video by Wes McDermott who works with Adobe and Substance Painter. And he talks about this very well in a recent video. I was actually prepping and doing some research on the topic and he posted this video a few weeks ago as I was doing research. So I was like, perfect timing, I'll link this. Another really good resource is there's this really old forum back from 2011. You'll see that I used the same cylinders here to kind of do my own testing and they talk about this concept way back when when re people really started to pick up on the normal mapping. So take a look, I'll drop this in the description, both of these in the description, so you can take a look at it for achieving the best big possible and understanding hard edges and UV seams. So to recap, the most important thing is if you do use this, right? And if you do go this route of using hard edges, then you want to make sure that you do have UV seams in every place that you have hard edges. Now, I do wanna bring up this last caveat because you might be like, well, this looks fine, right? If I look at this in Substance Painter and the bake for this high poly, or excuse me, this low poly looks okay, right? Looks okay. And the problem or the challenge now is if I switch over to normal maps here, you can see that the normal map has a ton of gradation happening. Now the model, again, itself will look okay, but there's a lot of gradation. And the thing that you need to understand about gradients, especially in game development and game ready assets, is that it causes compression issues. I have these exact same models here inside of Unreal Engine. So if I jump into Unreal Engine and zoom in on this model, now if we rotate around, you can see those artifacts from all of that gradient is showing up in this model and showing up in the textures, which is something that we don't want. Here you can actually see the issue with the black lines and the black seams, the white seams, they start to show up here in these cracks. And then here's the ideal scenario where we're minimizing the gradient from the texture baking normal map, and we're minimizing 
and completely removing the white and black cracks that are happening from the seams. So do keep in mind that you want to minimize gradients in your maps and then again use UV seams where you have hard edges. Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a few seconds and give a big thank you to all my current patrons. My Patreon has grown really fast over the past few months. We're almost at 100 members. I've heard from quite a few members that they want to see custom courses, so stay tuned as I have some big announcements coming over the next few videos on future courses. Now back to the video. So back to Blender, we'll look at the next tip here where you want to make sure that you're utilizing as much UV space as possible. You can see here in this model that there's actually quite a bit of unused UV space. Something that you can do is continue to split your shells and split your islands to help this pack better. So I can split that and you'll see an example here if I grab my long cult and grab all of these assets here. I'll actually just hide these and select all and let's look at our model. And the first thing I need to do is just hide what's called the energy source. I actually have some interior components here that are on a completely separate texture set. So I'll hide that and if we now look at just the assets here, you can see that everything is packed very nicely and very neat. And I'll hide this cylinder as well so we can select all of these components and you can see all of the packing. Now, the one thing that's not on there is the cylinder, but basically what's happening is every bit here is being utilized through the packing. So you can see I'm actually using in Blender an add-on called UV Packer that works incredibly well. That also includes padding here. When you're typically working with at least 2K images, you want 16 pixels of padding. This will give us the best type of bake. And you'll see that looking at this inside of substance and we look at the 2d view when you export it the padding is being leveraged inside of the engine here as well so if i open up the material you'll see that we're having this padding right in here that's basically hiding the seams of our uvs the next thing that i want to look at is when you run into challenges and issues with complex models we do not want to bake it in this static pose. Instead, what you want to do is use kind of this exploded view of this gun or an exploded view of whatever asset that you are creating. Because I know that rounds will be coming out of the cylinder, the trigger will be moving, the hammer. So if we look at this, making sure that you have this exploded view, because looking at this inside of Substance Painter here, now you can see, okay, everything's baking properly and everything is looking good. However, let's say this energy source that I have on the gun will be moving. Well, now we have all of this AO here and shadows baked into it. And if you're going to be using AO maps inside of your render engine, then you want to make sure that that's all cleaned up and exploded and separated from the mesh to not have any of that AO show up. Now, again, this is primarily the case where you're going to be baking anything that has animation. Going back, one of the final tips here, when you run into baking issues, using your own custom cage is going to help and give you the most control over how it bakes. For example, let's jump over to the baking menu here in Substance Painter, and that just took a second to load. But what you can see here is that the default cage in Substance Painter was just having an issue on this flat surface here. I'm not exactly sure why, and honestly, it was really frustrating because it just, this cage using this max frontal distance just wouldn't pick up any of this flat side of this surface here. So. When stuff like that happens and whatever bacon engine that you're using is causing you issues, just take it into your hands and use a custom cage. So you can see I have a custom cage here. So if I do use cage, now you're gonna see a lot of things turn red. That's because when baking using your own custom cage in Substance Painter, you have to bake based on your texture sets. I will just only show the energy source here and this is the only thing that I'm baking. The rest of the gun is on its own separate cage. So looking at this inside of Blender, I have an example here of the cage. If I grab the revolver, what you need to do is take the low poly original model, duplicate it, combine it into a single mesh based off of your texture sets. Then once it's all combined, just select everything and simply hit Alt S. What Alt S does is the same thing as use 
move on max frontal distance. It just moves all the vertices on a normal. Now, if I select this and give it a material, what I have here is now you can select all of this and do Alt S and move on the normal. So you can see I did it red and blue just so you can kind of see where we get any clipping. So I just want to make sure I forgot the cylinder, but that's fine. There we go. And moving it on the normal will make sure that you have complete control over this. So again, you would then bring that in here and bake it based off the texture set. So once you bake it for this texture set, then you can disable it, show the original long cold or the, the low poly and use use cage and then swap this to the right one. So here I have this selected, I hit open and now I'm baking it for the rest of the gun. And you can see I no longer have that issue right up here when I'm trying to bake it. This gives you the most control over how the texture baking will happen. Side note, this whole thing of baking with cages on specific texture sets, I actually ran into some issues because I was bringing everything in on a single cage trying to bake the entire model. And looking online, I couldn't find any great resources about it until I found this one thread on Reddit where they talk about it specifically. And this person, Dusty Shinigami, posted this, couldn't get actually a lot of help. And then he came back after finding the solution buried in some other forums and posted it here. And when I saw that, I implemented it and it worked right away. So shout out to anybody that comes back to forum posts where you don't get solutions and then you post the solution yourself. So that was a big help, saved me a bit of time. So I wanted to give a shout out to Dusty Shinigami from the Armaya Reddit. And the last bonus tip, especially when doing baking in any and most baking engines is using what's called match by name. You see here that everything's broken off. They're not just random poly surface or cylinder 01 or cylinder 96. Inside of Blender, there's a really good tool that does batch renaming. And it's right here under edit batch rename. And then you can do a find and replace. So if you take the time and just name everything properly here. You can see I have barrel base, barrel cover, and then everything has an underscore low for the low poly, and then anything that's high poly will have underscore high. And using, again, batch rename, you can just do a find and replace for underscore low, replace with underscore high, and you're not gonna have to rename a bunch of different types of objects. So it's one of those things that will just give you much cleaner bakes especially going in here as you're trying to bake this because without it, it's going to have a hard time baking in these areas, right? So let's disable by mesh name, just set it back to always disable our use cage, lower the max frontal distance and do a rebake and let's see what that original bake looks like. Okay, so it finished and you can see that you start to get artifacts in some of these areas around the gun, especially when you have objects that are essentially colliding and intersecting each other, right? And that's going to, again, lead to a lot of noisier bakes and messier bakes, right? So you see all of these artifacts, and I know this is a pain. So when you use a custom cage, which isn't always necessary, but I had to use it for that flat surface, and then you do match by name, Give it a second and you can see that everything is nicely matched here. By doing this will fix, I would say, like 99% of your problem. So I'll leave this at this view and then do a rebake with the cage and match by mesh name. And there you go. I mean, look how good that looks. It cleaned up essentially all of that nastiness that we got from the close intersecting geometry and everything just looks so clean and so good. So if you haven't been baking by using the mesh names, make sure you do that. And if you still run into issues with the default baker inside of Substance Painter or really any other one, then using a custom cage will make sure it cleans all of that up. And then make sure to keep an eye on your hard edges and UV seams. But that about wraps up everything that I wanted to showcase here. I know these were just a good handful of tips. These are all things that I went through to bake this model here and get it ready for texturing. And again, I've captured the entire process. I'll be posting the full 
unedited version on my Patreon. So if you want to go ahead and check that out there, and I will be putting this gun up there as well for anybody that wants to grab it through the Patreon. So it's a great way to support the channel and be sure to check out the Discord. So with that, I'll see everybody around and let me know if you have any questions or comments.